Today I'm going to be talking about complicated pericarditis, diagnostic testing related and treatment options. Recently we published a very key article in the Journal American College of Cardiology called Complicated Pericarditis, Understanding Risk Factors and Pathophysiology to Inform Imaging and Treatment. This is led by Dr. Kramer and I was the senior author. And this is the state-of-the-art review um, on pericarditis. So I'm going to divide this talk into four stages. Uh, the anatomy, the stages, etiology, and complications. I'll talk about multimodality imaging, how that plays a major role in pericarditis. What are some of the newer mechanisms of disease in recurrent pericarditis? And talk about some established and novel treatments to treat pericarditis. So here's an example of the pericardium that envelops the heart. And normally it has physiologic function. But sometimes you can get inflammation of the pericardial sac uh, causing pericarditis. Classically, uh, clinicians have used the EKG to assess uh, pericarditis. And this slide shows the, the classic a J point as the uh, diffuse elevation, as well as um, PR depression and J point depression. And people have used this for years. But now we've come a long way with advanced imaging uh, shown here. This is a, a case of complicated pericarditis, so called recurrent pericarditis, where on the left you can see uh, edema, the white around the heart suggests that there's inflammation uh, on the right, and edema on the left. This patient has rip-roaring recurrent pericarditis. Uh, and based on the appearance on the advanced imaging, this patient would take two to three years of anti-inflammatories to treat. So now we can prognosticate uh, how long um, to treat these type patients. We have to remember that you still have to be a clinician. Uh, this is a, another case of complicated pericarditis, that of constrictive pericarditis. This gentleman uh, from upstate New York uh, saw uh, had a um, SVT ablation and saw, as he said, 14 different specialists and nobody uh, diagnosed constrictive pericarditis because they forgot to look at his uh, neck veins. Uh, JVP was elevated. Uh, they were just giving him diuretics, so this is a, a, a case of um, constrictive pericarditis. Let's talk about the anatomy, stages, etiology, and complications. So I'm going to review the pericardial anatomy. Um, on the bottom, you can see that the pericardium has several layers. It has a serous layer divided into the visceral and the uh, parietal pericardium. And then you have the fibrous layer. On the top right, um, I'll go through each of the layers. Uh, it's almost like an onion. On top, you have the endocardium, followed by the myocardium. Then you have a layer of fat, the epicardial fat. And then you have the visceral or epicardium. And then you have the pericardial cavity followed by the parietal um, uh, layer of the serous pericardium. There's a fibrous pericardium in purple below and following the epipericardial fat. So you can see that the, uh, the anatomy is, is quite complex but, and has different layers. Here's an example of the normal pericardial histology. Uh, on your left, you can see there is parietal uh, pericardium. There is a mesothelial uh, layer in blue on top and a, and a fibrous uh, layer uh, below. And then on the right, you can see the visceral pericardium, where you, where you have mesothelial cells, uh, and then you ha have the muscle of the myocardium. And below, sometimes between the epicardium and the muscle, you have a layer of epicardial fat. But what happens when you get pericarditis? This slide shows some of the examples. On your far left is an example of uh, uremia, where you get um, inflammation, um, you get fibrin deposits in the pericardial space. And in the middle panel, you have neo, uh, neoplastic disease, where you get some bleeding into the fibrin, and now the layers are, tr are trying to fuse. And in the far right is somebody that's had uh, radiation that the uh, pericardial layer in the gray is all fused. So these are different cases of pathology of the um, of pericarditis. How about the histopathology uh, of pericarditis? On your upper left, you can see example of fibrinous pericarditis we get fibrin deposits into the pericardial space. Uh, panel B uh, shows acute pericarditis. We get um, influx of uh, neutrophils into the pericardial space. 
you get disruption of the mesothelial layer. Uh, in panel C, you see organization of the fibrinous exudate. And basically, you grow new blood vessels, get neovascularization. And uh, panel D shows end stage fibrosis. So, just to summarize some of the stages of pericarditis, you have the acute pericarditis, and then this uh, can lead to complicated pericarditis, which can include constrictive pericarditis. So, in our, in our article, uh, by Dr. Kramer, we, we summarize some of these findings. Let me, let me go through this. This is the incidence of short-term uh, adverse events that complicated disease after an episode of acute pericarditis. When somebody has acute pericarditis, you get a viral illness, most of the time uh, it resolves. Majority of the time it resolves. Occasionally, uh, one to two percent, you can get cardiac tamponade. Fifteen percent, you can get myocardial involvement. As you can see on the MRI, there's a low uh, scarring subendocardial scarring. And this is the majority of type cases. However, uh, sometimes uh, 15 to 30 percent can get complicated pericarditis, which includes recurrent pericarditis, or you can get multiple recurrences in 6 percent. And sometimes you can get, they get reversible constriction or chronic constrictive pericarditis. So once again, just to emphasize most resolve, but some could get complicated. Let's, uh, let's review the definitions, the current definitions from the European guidelines, how we diagnose acute and recurrent pericarditis, definitions and diagnostic criteria. So acute pericarditis to diagnosis in 2016, uh, basically you need two or four clinical criteria. You need classic chest pain, pleuritic chest pain. You need a pericardial rub, abnormal EKG, including ST elevation or PR depression on EKG or a newer worsening pericardial effusion. And then you can do uh, additional supporting findings, including markers of inflammation, CRP, ultrasensitive CRP, set rate, or white count, or an MRI. But once again, two of four. Now, let's define some newer terms. It's incessant pericarditis means that the pericarditis is continuous. It lasts more than four to six weeks, but less than three months without remission. Incessant. Now, the classic definition of recurrent means that you have the pericarditis, you have the first episode, and then you get a break, a symptom-free break for four to six weeks or longer. This is what we call recurrent. And chronic means that it lasts more than three months. So having said that, there is a lot of overlap with these definitions, but this is how we look at these patients. Uh, in terms of etiology of pericarditis, uh, there's basically infectious causes, which is the majority of the cases. Usually it's viral or idiopathic. Somebody gets a Coxsackie B infection. You get a flu. Uh, and this is um, 80, 90 percent of the cases in the Western world uh, have, have this etiology. Uh, in the developing or emerging world, it's uh, TB is the most common uh, cause. If you were in India, uh, TB would be the most common cause of pericarditis. We have to remember there are some newer causes, non-infectious causes, that's very common now. Traumatic and iatrogenic, I hate to say, um, uh, early onset perforation, you're doing a heart cath, you're putting a pacemaker and you perforate. You get blood in the pericardial space and this is a very uh, a bad thing because you can get pericarditis. Or you can have delayed onset. Uh, for example, after a heart attack, you get a Dresler syndrome. This may occur after uh, open heart surgery, you do valve surgery. Uh, after a pacemaker and uh, other, other injury. We have to remember you can get autoimmune causes, um, for example, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, finally, a neoplastic cause is not uncommon. So let me review um, the classification of pericarditis based on time scale. Um, chronic pericarditis is symptoms over three months. Incessant pericarditis is symptoms uh, continuous for more than four to six weeks, less than three months. Uh, acute pericarditis is really new onset pericarditis. And then if you get a symptom-free interval of four to six weeks, this is called recurrent pericarditis. We also have to remember sometimes you can get perimyocarditis versus myopericarditis. Uh, perimyocarditis means that the predominant finding uh, is in the muscle. Uh, this is an example of an MRI showing some scarring in the uh, muscle, as shown by the uh, yellow arrow, and you get a little pericarditis shown by the green arrow, uh, versus a myopericarditis, which is a little more benign, that's mainly the pericarditis and a little uh, muscle involvement. 
Uh, and this is may, may be seen quite often uh, in pericarditis syndromes. Another complicated uh, pericarditis case is constrictive pericarditis. This is an example of a 40-year-old that had a viral illness and developed a, uh, a fusion around the heart, as you can see on the echo. The patient has a septal bounce uh, and tethering of the heart, and this patient uh, eventually uh, went to surgery. So what are some of the risk factors for developing this so-called complicated uh, disease or complicated pericarditis after an episode of acute pericarditis? Well, we look at treatment-related variables as well as patient-related var variables. The treatment-related variables uh, are if you introduce steroids early. If, you, you, uh, if a clinician gives high-dose steroids, this could cause um, uh, problems later. Or you, you uh, don't give the colchicine uh, would be a, a treatment-related variable. Patient-related variables include you in inappropriately or undertreated the patient with NSAIDs. You didn't give enough aspirin or indomethacin or ibuprofen. Or you have a very high um, CRP, a high, highly sensitive uh, CRP. Uh, this would be a bad uh, prognosticator. Uh, Patient-related variables uh, without really increased risk are age, sex, or pericardial effusion. Now let's turn to multimodality imaging. Uh, here's an example of multimodality imaging, how this can be used in complicated pericarditis. The echocardiogram uh, shows the septal balance, the constricted pericarditis. On your far right, you can see an MRI. Uh, this shows um, inflammation of the, of the layers of the, um, of the pericardi pericardium with late ganglion enhancement. It looks like a reverse Oreo cookie with the uh, black as the uh, inside, and you see the two layers that are white uh, uh, around the heart. And in the bottom panel shows a CT scan showing calcium all around the heart. So this is how we use multimodality imaging to assess these type patients. Now in our paper, uh, we talk about the different stages of pericarditis, some of the imaging, and some of the treatment effects. So let's take that, let's go through this. So the first stage would be the acute pericarditis. And when do you do the imaging? Well, echocardiogram is always first line, and it can be used to assess pericardial fusion, uh, myocardial involvement or the constriction. And how do you treat this acute case? Uh, you give NSAIDs um, for uh, uh, several weeks, gradually wean this, or you can give colchicine up to three months. So that's the acute stage. And then it gets complicated. You get a first recurrence. Uh, you may do the uh, imaging, the echocardiogram to assess constriction. And now this time you may consider CMR, um, it's, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, in select cases for pericardial inflammation or constriction. Uh, in this case, you may give NSAIDs a little bit longer, weeks to months, colchicine, uh, more than six months. Now, you may have multiple recurrences. The imaging is similar to as if you had a first recurrence, and now you're adding different uh, treatments. You're giving NSAIDs plus the colchicine, and now you're even throwing in prednisone for over six months with a very, very slow taper. And at this point, for these multiple recurrences, you may need steroid sparing agents. Uh, and finally, our um, next stage would be colchicine resistant or steroid dependent. Uh, the imaging is um, for the same as the first recurrence, and you may uh, uh, add now NSAIDs plus colchicine plus prednisone plus steroid sparing agents, and you may even consider uh, to remove the sac, pericardiectomy. And the final uh, stages of the pericarditis is constriction, where the imaging for echo is the same as first recurrence, uh, and MRI could be used as well, but sometimes you can do CAT scanning, CT scanning, to look at the calcium around the heart and to uh, plan, uh, preoperatively plan the case. And the treatment, um, if it's an inflammation, you may intensify medical therapy with anti-inflammatories, or you may just do the pericardiectomy if burnt out. So I'd like to show some examples uh, of the uh, advanced imaging. Uh, here's an echo showing a, peric a moderate pericardial fusion on your left uh, and constrictive physiology on your right. So this is how echo can be used for these type cases. Here's an example of the powerful role of the CMR of the pericardium. So we have three different cases. We have normal, we have active pericarditis, and chronic constrictive pericarditis. And the panels of the imaging are dark blood, which measures the thickness, the T2 stir, which measures the swelling or the edema, and the LGE, which measures the inflammation. So on the top panel, uh, the normal panel, you can see everything is basically negative. There's no increased thickness, no edema, and no inflammation. 
the middle panel shows this active pericarditis. Um, the panel D shows um, uh, no increased thickness. However, panel E shows this white around the heart. That's the swelling. That tells me that's uh, pretty recent. And then uh, panel F sh uh, shows the white line around the heart. This is the inflammation. So we can say that this is very severe active pericarditis with edema and inflammation. The bottom panel shows the chronic constrictive pericarditis. A panel G shows this uh, uh, black line, um, and this is the increased thickness, more than four millimeters, which, which implies increased thickness. Uh, panel H shows no edema, and panel I shows no inf um, inflammation. So these are the different stages of pericarditis picked up by MRI. So I'd like to now go over the histo histology of this inflammation. So we, we did a study uh, several years ago, Dr. Zurich and myself, published in Jack Imaging, where we asked the question, uh, if you have delayed enhancement, this inflammation in the MRI, what would be the pathology? So we, we sent patients that had pericardectomy to, um, we sent that sample to the pathologist, and we found that basically, that when you have uh, delayed enhancement, that white around the heart, you really grow new blood vessels, you get neovascularization, uh, you, uh, that um, when you give the dye, it seeps into the pericardial space. And as you get more uh, organized pericarditis, or organized fibrous pericarditis, you don't get any delayed enhancement. So basically, the white around the heart, the inflammation, means that you get inflammation of the sac and you grow new blood vessels, shown by the immunostain with CD34. Let's now turn to mechanisms of disease. And this is very exciting work. Um, so in our article, we talked about this concept of the inflammasome, activation of the inflammasome. Uh, and uh, this may be the main mechanism in recurrent idiopathic pericarditis. So we have to distinguish auto-inflammatory from autoimmune. So basically, there is an interplay between the triggers and innate and adaptive immune systems in somebody that's predisposed to get pericarditis. So this uh, inflammasome concept, um, you can see in the diagram, um, the inflammasome is basically a uh, cytostolic macromolecule, ma macromolecule within the cell. And you get different triggers. For example, in the diagram, you can get a, a microbial attack, a virus. Let's say you get influenza. And this will uh, activate the receptors, this inflammasome. And these triggers um, will cause the inflammasome to secrete the um, interleukins. And interleukins are very pro-inflammatory. And um, we have blockers of these interleukins uh, called anakinra. So this is one of the, uh, the mechanisms. Sometimes in different diseases, you get, may, may get mutations in the genes. Familial Mediterranean fever may have a mutation. So this is maybe one of the thinkings of why you get recurrent pericarditis, because you get this activation of this inflammasome. Versus autoimmune, where you get uh, uh, autoantibodies, for example, uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So there's, we have to try to separate with autoinflammatory, which is uh, the majority, versus autoimmune. Let's talk about established and novel treatments. Uh, the classic treatment of pericarditis will be uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which includes aspirin, ibuprofen, or endomethacin. Aspirin is given to somebody uh, that's maybe a little bit older, that may have coronary artery disease. Uh, the mainstay would be uh, probably ibuprofen or endomethacin. And then the next uh, drug would be colchicine, which is considered first line. There'd be many, many studies with colchicine showing uh, a decrease in recurrences um, uh, in, uh, in pericarditis. Uh, prednisone can be given, but we try to avoid that. As we mentioned earlier, that prednisone could cause, um, cause more recurrences. But sometimes when it's very inflamed, we may have to give triple therapy based on the imaging. That includes the NSAID, colchicine, and prednisone. For attractable cases, um, you may have to give a DMARD, disease-modifying disease agent, some, something like um, Imuran or azathioprine. And now we, we're giving biologics called anakinra, and rarely we do, we do surgery for this. So this, uh, this slide shows these emerging therapies. Uh, as I mentioned, azothioprine or imuran uh, can be given for these intractable cases. Uh, it can be given at least uh, six months. Uh, you, human immunoglobulins can be given as well. We rarely do this. It's very, very expensive, but it can be done. And the, the exciting area is actually these biologics called anakinra where you can give one to two um, milligram per kilogram per day, up to 100 milligrams per day in adults. 
and you can give it for at least six months to a year. But the problem is, as soon as you stop it, it, it can recur. So that's one of the limitations. And nowadays, we are sending more and more patients for pericardiectomy uh, once you exhaust uh, the medical therapy. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I'm very excited about this topic. As you can see, uh, we, we discovered a, a term complicated pericarditis, and we went over some of the uh, stages, some of the anatomy, uh, some of the uh, role of multimodality imaging, the mechanisms, and, and the therapies. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.